Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to class today and for being here for my seminar presentation. So I hope you enjoy the next uh, roughly 45 minutes as we run through this. I'm going to try and keep it as uh, brief and concise as I can. But uh, yeah. So today I would like to talk about an emerging and increasingly re relevant genre in documentary image making, that of films and photos about human migration. The effects of global conflict, climate change, civil instability, and neoliberal reconstruction of urban environments is disrupting a large portion of the human population, causing a forced movement of humans from place to place. Examples include the European migrant crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis, but today I also want to be speaking about people who are displaced by climate change, as well as the victims of gentrification and urban relocation. So I'm going to open with uh, talking about the uh, United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which declares that an individual has the right uh, to the freedom of movement and residence within their own state, and the right to leave any country, including their own, and the right to return to their own country. As well, they have the right to seek asylum from persecution. Uh, so these are detailed in Article 13 and 14 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I want to posit as well that uh, hu humans have a general right to mobility, that a body has the right to freely move and determine where they want to live. These films will demonstrate that these crises are an attack on this human right to mobility and that there are power structures in place that have a vested interest in controlling and managing an individual's and a community's mobility by forcing them to relocate or controlling their access and ability as to where they can relocate. While people have always been migrating and immigrating, modern technology, geopolitical structures, and the increasing effects of climate change are accelerating the amount of people and communities who are being displaced, and these crises are growing. Naturally, this has attracted the attention of documentary image makers, and there is an increasing growth of work dedicated to exploring and telling stories about human migration. So I posit today that these films and photos are an explanation of the human right to mobility and an exploration of the power structures that control and attack free human mobility. These films ask the question of who has the power to move, who is forced to move, who controls and who limits movement. Uh, I'm working off the definition of migration as a body, either an individual or a community, often both, that are moving from one place to another and that these migration documentaries explore which bodies have the power to move freely and which bodies are limited in their movement. So often this movement is subjected to and controlled by overarching power structures and these documentary works have the power to question and interrogate these power structures. As we will see, different documentary works will deploy different strategies that uh, convey this problem of mobility and the limits of a body's freedom to mobility and who is providing the limits for that. Uh, so I want to first discuss how different documentary films about migration both address the problems of human migration and specifically how they relate to a body's freedom of mobility. So I want to speak first about three films. So these films cover different perspectives and contend with their own issues of representation and visual exploitation, along with different ways of criticizing the power structures controlling a body's mobility. Kaisa Hiltunen writes how documentary films about migrants attempt to narrow the gap between them and us. I will be looking at the films Migrant Dreams by Min Suk Lee, Salam Neighbor by Chris Temple and Zach Ingraski, and the film Fire at Sea by John Franco Rossi. All these films look at different migrant issues in different countries and focus on different communities, with the filmmakers employing their unique perspectives for each film. So to start off, Min Suk, Min Suk Lee's Migrant Dreams is about migrant workers in Leamington, Ontario, and it tells the undertold story of migrant agricultural workers struggling against Canada's temporary foreign worker program that treats foreign workers as modern day indentured laborers. Under the rules of Canada's migrant labor program, low wage migrants are tied to one employer, meaning that they can't find Ill income elsewhere. These, this film explores the power structures that take advantage of the labor of migrant workers and how these 
power structures control the migrant workers' mobility in Canada. The film reveals the difficulties and the threats the workers face if they do not comply with the one company that they work for. Lee writes in her director statement how for Canadian employers, low wage migrant workers are a permanently flexible and pliant workforce. A feature of their lives is their deportability. Citizen bosses can wield the power of citizenship over the low wage non-status worker. And here we can see a large threat that is employed, that of deportation. These migrant workers are exactly under threat because their mobility is controlled. They are able to be sent away from their place of employment at will, according to their employer. So in this film, Lee also interrogates these laws and systems of power that allow the companies to take advantage of this lack of mobility. The film shows how the vulnerability of the migrants is taken advantage of and the tight control of the migrants' freedom of mobility binds them to an exploitative situation. Migrant Dreams opens with panoramic drone shots, establishing the size of the colossal size of the greenhouses and factories where the migrants work, setting up the large controlling corporations who function as an adversary for the workers. The film then explains how workers are brought from their origin country and are put into debt immediately as they are required to pay back the application, the travel costs, and the costs of living there. A large conflict of the film that Sook Lee focuses on is that the migrant workers are constantly supervised and their life outside the factory is controlled and monitored, as these debt collectors visit them every paycheck to collect the debts that they owe. As well, the company attempts to collect the workers' passports and migrants face non-stop threats to be sent back to their home country. The company profits from the vulnerability of the workers, attempting to constrict and control the migrants' mobility through these methods that exploit their labor. Lee exposes these abuses, but centers the workers' experience, as well as their ability to push back and resist these exploitative practices. The workers oppose the control of their li over their living situation, and Lee shows the steps, sorry about that, and Lee shows the steps they take to find their own apartment and move out of the company's residence. This resistance is framed as their ability to find a home where they are free to come and go without being monitored by the companies. Most importantly, Lee respects the agency of the migrants and allows them to express their hopes and dreams for the future, one they are not, where they are not tied to working and not tied to paying off their debt. Their bodies are limited in mobility, but their minds and aspirations are not bound. This idea of hope liberates the workers, metaphorically, as there is another way for them to be independent. But again, the company exploits these dreams as the workers' hopes for upward mobility is tied to their compliance to the company. Speaking out is a major act that jeopardizes their future. So as we can see, the speaking out and any opposition to the company is tied to this idea that the workers' mobility is limited in and of itself. They are told where to go, uh, where to live, and the very act of determining for themselves where to live, asserting their right to mobility, is what's threatened by the company. That is seen as a, as a rebellious move. So, and even making the film itself was a rebellious act as they were speaking out against these abuses. And this, uh, this shows that migrant stories to me are intrinsically tied to who has the power to move and what power structures allow for their movement. Uh, in the case of migrant dreams, it's the workers' move mobility that is limited and it's the employers that are able to limit and take advantage of this mobility. The structure of the film Salam Neighbor makes the power imbalance between the migrants and other citizens extremely obvious. This film tells the story of two, fil two filmmakers who, in order to empathize with Syrian migrants, move into a Syrian migrant encampment in Jordan to create a documentary. Their very first night there, the power imbalance between the filmmakers and the migrants is made clear. While the filmmakers wanted to stay overnight to learn about the migrants' perspective, they are escorted out of the camp to sleep in a hotel in town out of concern for their safety. Now, the film does not frame it in this way, but the power imbalance between the mobilities of the two different groups is clear. The filmmakers have the ability and, well, 
the, fil the filmmakers have the ability to leave the camp while the refugees must stay in the camp still to remain in those dangerous conditions. So Kaiser Hiltonen speaks how documentaries about migration attempt to bridge the gap between the zone of comfort and the zone of suffering. In other words, the primarily Western audience is separated from these migrant crises to whom this film is directed and the people who are subjected and controlled as they attempt to migrate, the people about whom this film is about. Um, so while this film is attempting to bridge the gap by centering the stories of the refugees, and as the filmmakers, they try to experience their lives on an equal footing, the film inadvertently demonstrates these two zones and which bodies are free to move between them. As Hiltonen says, in discussion with the refugees, there is a spirit of solidarity, but when the filming is over, only the filmmakers are allowed to go home. The film centers the lives and the stories of migrants as they are experienced by the filmmakers. The climax of the film happens when the filmmakers react to the trauma of a boy, Ralph, in the encampment. The camera lingers on one of the filmmakers as he cries in response to hearing of his trauma, centering the trauma and the story away from Ralph's experience and instead to the effect that this story creates to the individual filmmakers. The filmmakers also place great relevance on how they are some of the few who are allowed residence in the migrant camp. The filmmakers are allowed to insert themselves into a migrant camp, which has limited space. They sleep in a motel every night and at the end of three months of filming, return home while the refugees are still contained in this camp. So while they were attempting to bridge the gap between these two zones, uh, the very act of doing so in this method exposes the gap even more. The filmmakers have the complete freedom to eventually call it a day and go home and finish their film, while the migrants are left behind and contained in these encampments. So a film that I want to bring up in contrast to Salam Maker is the film Fire at Sea. So John Franco Rossi's film Fire at Sea explores the migrant crisis but in terms of how the zone of comfort and the zone of suffering do not mix, comparing the lives of two different groups on the island of Lampedusa in Italy. So the film consists of two parallel narratives, one about the islanders going about their everyday lives and the other about the rescue operations. The parallel structure highlights Rossi's idea about two worlds or zones that do not really meet. They Throughout the film, the only instance of these two zones intermingling is at the beginning of the film, uh, a Italian grandmother related to uh, the main character of the film overhears about a crisis, a migrant crisis on the sea and just makes a brief comment and the main character and the migrants share a doctor. That's the only interaction that the film establishes between the two. So the question of mobility is addressed in this film as well, in the way that these two worlds do access and navigate the sea. The sea is the other thing that binds them together. So one of the main characters that I've mentioned earlier is a resident on Lampedusa, a boy who's named Samuel. And in one sequence, Samuel is learning how to row a boat on the sea and as a result has to contend and overcome his seasickness in order to be able to go out. This scene is put in contrast with the experience of the migrants where the sea represents a path to freedom, but it is also a death sentence. The climax of the film shows the rescue of a migrant boat where some migrants are able to step off the boat onto the rescue boat. Some have to be assisted off the rescue boat, so dehydrated that they need severe medical attention and are unable to move. And in an especially shocking sequence, Rossi shows the bodies of the migrants who have passed away and who are not able to make their way off the boat. So on the one hand, while Samuel must contend with seasickness to navigate the sea, the migrants must contend with the lethal situation on the sea to move to a safer location. Rossi then further explores the constraints to the migrants' mobility, showing how the migrants are lined up photographed, directed, and contained in different camps. Their mobility controlled first by the sea, but then by the island and the immigration authorities. The way that one is world is able to freely move on the island and on the sea, 
while another world is trapped on the sea and then later on the land itself, shows the strong separation between the zone of comfort and the zone of suffering. While the two worlds are seemingly unrelated and have nothing to do with each other other than their geographic proximity, it is exactly this unrelatedness that Rossi problematizes in the film and the fact that the two zones are so segregated is the problem for Rossi. Emma Wilson writes that the very spectral presence of the migrants on the island, the inaccessibility of their stories, the constant uprootedness, homelessness, and precariousness to which they are condemned in an increasingly inhospitable Europe is revealed powerfully by the film, in, pipe, in part by their very silence and in the apparent schism between the two narrative lines. On the island of Lampedusa, the native residents are portrayed freely walking around the island and floating on the sea, their power in mobility contained by the state and the sea. These two groups do not mix, except for their shared island doctor and a short acknowledgement from Samuel's relative when hearing about the crisis on the radio. It is the separation between these two zones and the inability to freely navigate between the two that creates the conflict for Rossi that is at the heart of the film. Now, the films that I have spoken about so far depict migrants fleeing their countries of origin, either for economic opportunity or seeking safety as do most films in the genre of migration documentaries. With the change in global climate and the continuation of neoliberal urban re reconstruction, I argue that those perspectives are going to be represented in the emerging genre of, doc of migration documentary as well, as the people who are subject to this urban reconstruction navigate and depict their own issues of limited mobility. Uh, sorry, uh, changes in uh, climate as they have to navigate <laughs> and navigate their own issues of mobility. So changes in the Earth's climate are increasingly affecting the homes and habitats of humans, forcibly displacing them either due to natural disasters or to a climate that changes so drastically that they will no longer be able to live in their home. In the hottest August, filmmaker Brett Story documents the collective anxiety around climate change in New York and in a particular sequence, represents communities whose homes have been affected and damaged by hurricanes and floods. With the increase of the frequency and strength of hurricanes and flooding due to climate change, these issues will arise and are going to be reflected in documentary work of the future. Climate change will displace people from their homes and like current migrants, their mobility will be controlled as they are forced to leave their homes and are policed as they try to resettle. So in this particular sequence in the hottest August, the people who are affected by these floods and hurricanes are keeping in mind that in the future they will potentially have to contend with whether they will have to leave or will they have to stay despite the changes in climate. This anxiety is captured in this film. Uh, another film that I want to discuss, which is not necessarily, it doesn't depict a disaster that's brought on necessarily by climate change, more of human error, but the disaster of Hurricane Katrina and its effect on the black population of New Orleans was documented by Spike Lee in the film When the Levees Broke. Here, Lee depicts the difference in experience between the white and black communities of New Orleans, as both were forcibly moved due to the hurricane and the issues around the hurricane. But the question of who was allowed to return to the homes of New Orleans and who was not invited to come back is what Lee problematizes, calling out the racism inherent in the restructuring of post-Katrina New Orleans. Most of the white people who were displaced could return to their home, while most of the black people who were, uh, who were uh, displaced had to resettle somewhere else which is clearly revealing a racial element in the forced resettling. So again, primarily white neighborhoods uh, and the people within them were invited to return to the rebuilt New Orleans, while primarily black neighborhoods were resettled and were, they, as well, New Orleans took the opportunity to gentrify those neighborhoods. So these two films that I'm speaking about are not centered as migrant stories, but the conflicts inherent in them reflect on themes of climate migration, something that will become even more prevalent if we continue on this current path of climate change. 
as I've mentioned uh, specifically when the levees broke, but both films reflect on themes of urban migration and urban restructuring, where people are either pressured or forced to move from their homes and communities to make way for a more desirable or wealthier community, a process commonly referred to as gentrification. So the discourse around gentrification itself is complex. There's no necessarily fixed agreed upon definition. But the problem boils down to me is who has the power and the ability to move into a neighborhood and who does not have the power or ability to stay in a neighborhood. So who or which bodies choose to move and which bodies are forced to move. The film Priced Out represents this conflict, telling the story of gentrification of a neighborhood through the eyes of a main character in Portland, Oregon. The filmmaker Cornelia Swart constructs a comparison between his own experiences of gentrification and that of the main subject of his film, Nikki Williams. Swart is a white journalist who opens the film expressing how well he is adjusting into the newly gentrified neighborhood of Portland, while Williams, a black woman who lives in the same neighborhood as Swart, expresses her alienation in her changed neighborhood. At the end of the film, Swart leaves Portland to visit Williams, who, through all this alienation that he has experienced that is discussed in depth in the film, Williams has relocated across the country to Houston. Williams felt pressured to leave Portland as her neighborhood changed from a low-income, predominantly Black neighborhood to a wealthier, white, gentrified neighborhood. Again, look, examining the question, who has the power to move and who has the power and ability to stay? Who is forced to move and who is forced to stay? Or who has the ability to stay? So while Priced Out shows how people are pressured out of their homes and communities, the film St. Cloud Hill depicts how a community is forcibly evicted, more, more forci forcibly evicted in a more direct way. St. Cloud Hill follows the story of a community of unhoused people who have established a tent city in an undeveloped plot of land in Nashville. So developers express interest in building on this previously undeveloped plot of land. And by the end of the film, the community is forcibly ev evicted and removed uh, and broken apart by the municipality and the police force. And they are forced to find shelter on their own and rebuild their community somewhere else in Nashville. So when the levees broke, Priced Out and St. Cloud Hill reflect how urban restructuring and gentrification films, they reflect themes found in other migrant documentaries, where the violence is enacted on a vulnerable population, this time in an urban setting, and through restricting their right and freedom of mobility, the freedom to choose where they want to live, the community is displaced and those communities are forced to resettle. I do want to make a key distinction between gentrification films uh, being fully included in this genre. And for me, that is the difference in forced movement within national borders and between international borders. So while I do argue that these documentaries depict a related conflict, the attack and restriction on human mobility, um, commonly human rights are tied to citizenship and a citizenship that international migrants are forced to ab abandon. Giorgio Agamben problematizes this relationship between human rights and citizenship using the case of refugees to develop this line of thinking, revealing how so-called Sacred and inalienable human rights are revealed to be without any protection precisely when it is no longer possible to conceive of them as rights of the citizens of a state. So while gentrification films present a similar conflict to me, the nature of their relation to human rights as it is a national migration is a relevant and necessary distinction to make. So when refugees and international migrants risk everything to come to another country, what they're doing is they effectively surrender their rights from their former country, trusting in the protection of the country they will try to move to. However, as the previous migrant documentaries that we have taken a look at um, reveal, migrants and refugees exist under a different set of rights as opposed to the citizens of the countries that they attempt to resettle. Their compromised mobility is taken advantage of and as seen in Salam neighbor, are put into camps where they can be controlled and monitored. 
again, we see this in migrant dreams where coming to Canada, they are controlled and monitored in fire at the sea as they um, navigate the dangers of the sea and make it to Lampedusa, they're still controlled and monitored within the camps. So Agamben further problematizes the problem of seeking asylum and being placed into camps at the border, explaining how refugee camps preceded concentration and concentra consequently extermination camps, a parallel that is being recreated on the southern borders of the United States. So Quoting, we should not forget that the first camps were built in Europe as spaces for controlling refugees and that the succession of internment camps, concentration camps, extermination camps represents a perfectly real fellation, something that we are all, even on the Canadian borders, we are contending with right now, uh, taking a look at those human rights abuses. But again, I do need to feel to make the distinction of migration into the United States and Canada and within the United States and Canada as primarily restrictions along borders and being placed into camps is the conflict with international migration while national migration, economic barriers and lack of economic access is the primary barrier that restricts people's mobilities. But with these refugee internment camps, the result is a power structure that is able to strictly control people's mobilities when they're seeking asylum. Once again, this recalls the core conflict of Salam neighbors, where filmmakers leave every night out of concern of the, for their own safety, while the refugees are constrained to the camp. Gentrification does intru introduce power structures, those economic barriers, that restrict people's mobilities and freedom of choice in choosing where they live, while international migrants are subject to stricter and more overtly violent forms of control. Agamben uses the problem of the refugee to argue for a stateless, truly universal human right. And I'll extend this argument that in addition to the universal, uh, United Nations Universal Declaration of the rights, of Human Rights, that a necessary right is that of complete freedom of mobility to move and live where one thinks is the best for their family, community, and safety, and to not be contained along borders. Um, as we move along, I do want to reference a few photo projects that also speak to similar themes and subjects as the documentary films that I've primarily been focusing on. So countries around the world are unable or unwilling to address the migrant crisis and continuing our tra current trajectory will only exacerbate and intensify this crisis. The effects of climate change will ravage coastal cities, increasing extreme weather conditions and flooding, changing the shorelines and very shapes of coastal cities. Um, so a photo project that anticipates this upcoming project, Solastalgia, which is a photo book by Marina Vitaglioni, and it laments the looming destruction of Venice, Italy, as climate change increasingly threatens the existence of the city. The title refers to the term solastalgia, which is a neologism that explains the personal feelings of emotional stress brought on by environmental change. Um, and with Vitaglioni already mourning the loss of Venice, a city threatened to be lost forever, and a whole population that as a result threatens to be displaced all due to the rising water levels brought on by climate change. So the book depicts, depicts the abandoned landscape of Venice, which is cleared of human presence and washed into the sea, a threat that, many, that faces many of the low-lying coastal cities around the world, and a threat that will displace millions, if not billions, of people from their former homes. Uh, continuing along this certain path undoubtedly will lead to a larger migrant crisis as cities become completely unlivable as they they just aren't there anymore so it remains uncertain how the world will react to this potential crisis and what the state of international borders will be at the onset of this crisis the problems that these documentaries have addressed so far do not fill me with confidence <laughs> that um, they don't fill me with confidence that the world will be able and the different nation states will be able to address these uh, new migration crises in an adequate way. Uh, to further problematize this idea of international borders which control uh, international migration and international mobility, 
these international borders of countries are a microcosm of the restriction of human mobility. Points where to legally pass through one country to another, a human is controlled, directed, and either accepted or denied entry. Photographer Ubed Ur Rahman explores this in a photo series of Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, sorry, a photo series that focuses on the Pakistan, Afghanistan border. Rahman describes the Pakistan, Afghanistan border as a major crossing point, explaining how thousands of people cross this border daily, but until a few years ago, they were able to freely cross this international border until. A, uh, a major terrorist attack in Peshawar, the government of Pakistan launched the visa and proper immigration uh, restrictions on this border. Only the people um, who will, sorry, only those nationals will be permitted to cross the border who have valid traveling documents. They have relatives on the other side and are unable to reach them due to physical barriers, just a glimpse through the face. It's so the photos of Rahman document how this separation has resulted in more than just a division of two countries. But exactly like he says, families that were freely able to travel and seek medical service from one side to another now have to spend days at the border to acquire the proper documents and are only able to catch glimpses of their family through chain link fences. Rahman problematizes this restriction on free mobility as previously families that were connected are now separated as the two governments enforce a complicated and alienating process for humans to cross a plot of land that until recently they were free to cross as they always have. At the core, this is the issue of human migration. Restrictions and controls are placed on a person or community's rights and access to free mobility. Sorry about that. These documentary works explore the international borders that control and contain refugee movement. Coercive laws and systems that prey on the labor of migrants and further investigate power structures that determine who has the power to move and who has the power to stay. Either for economic or safety reasons, a group of people are forcibly displaced from their home and that situation is taken advantage of as further controls are placed on the resulting mobility when they attempt to relocate themselves in the search of a better life. The global neoliberal institutions are profiting off this constraint for mobility, or they're also completely abandoning their care of a human's rights and are enforcing policies and actions that will exacerbate this problem through global conflict, climate change, and the development of the neoliberal city. Although their intentions generally are different, these films, photos, and documentary work of the image makers that I've presented are connected in their exploration of human control and containment through the restriction of a body's access and ability to move freely. So um, to get into the discussion questions, I have argued that documentary work about migration takes a look at the human right to free mobility and which bodies have the power to move and the power to stay. However, are there other issues that are common amongst this genre of documentary work, such as issues of representation, documentary reflexivity, or voyeurism, that the work in this genre should be addressing or problematizing? Um, I know that many of the films, I haven't discussed them as such, but there do exist issues of representation in looking at a vulnerable community uh, as opposed to look at uh, non-vulnerable community parachuting in and looking at them. So another uh, discussion question that I will pose and we can discuss later is, um, since migration documentary work has continued to grow as a genre, do you think that this growth is going to continue? Is migration documentary work going to increase in volume and relevance into the future? Or basically, do you think we're going to be able to get a handle on this? But um, what role and uh, what volume uh, and how do you see the future of migration documentary work developing as, as the world continues? Uh, as well, these are the works cited that I have uh, used in my presentation. And other than that, thank you very much to everyone for listening. And I look forward to your discussion questions.
and yeah.